Hello everyone and welcome to the Power Platform Show, formerly the Dynamics 365 Show. For today's show, we're with, talking with Peter Linke, he's the Chief Executive Officer of Promax AG. And we'll talk about his journey as an ISV, lessons learned, how he's pivoted as Microsoft bought out a competing product to his, but how he continued on and really how he's adopting the ISV Connect program, going in at the 20% level, absolutely interesting the insights he's shared here before we get into the show i just want to talk about another isv that specializes in the era of field service and um, this is map tasker they're a relatively new isv been going a couple of years and they have a product that deals uh, called field engineer for dynamics 365 and really anybody that's using you know field service type function i think would gain a lot of benefits from this product it's built specifically for companies that run field engineers. It allows them to gain access to detailed geospatial data from their internal systems. I especially like the way it works with Esri, ArcGIS, and allows that data to be synced directly into Dynamics 365 or the Power Platform. I've done many projects that required Esri integration, and MapTask would have made the job a lot easier. MapTasker's field engineer for Dynamics 365 not only allows you to access data from platforms like ArcGIS from Esri, but also write back to it, completing the cycle of data collection in the field. For more information on integrating Dynamics 365 with advanced geospatial systems, head over to maptasker.com and contact the team for a demo. MapTasker is spelled M-A-P-T-A-S-K-R. So M-A-P-T-A-S-K-R dot com. Now, let's get on to the show. Full show notes can be found at nz365guide.com forward slash 164. Hey, Peter, welcome to the show. Hey, how are you? Good, 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 good. Good to finally get you on the show and really unpack your journey. You know, you've been an ISB, kind of one of the ISB leaders, really, in the whole Dynamics community for some time. So I hope that we can have an interesting discussion in today's little chit chat. Yeah, I'm really happy looking forward. Excellent. Peter, before we do get underway, but can you tell me a bit about what part of the world you live in? And when you're not kind of working, what does play look for you look like for you? What do you do for relaxation? Yeah, first I'm living in Germany, in the south of Germany, in a part called Francodia. That's in my hometown is Nuremberg. And what I like to do as my hobbies is I would say diving and motorcycling. Wow. Hang on, tell me about your diving. I, I like a bit of scuba diving myself. Where do you dive? Well, usually I dive in the Red Sea or in the middle uh, in the Mediterranean Sea. So those are my most my main diving spots. Sometimes I go down to, to Africa or also to the United Arab Emirates for diving. I've never been at the Barrier Reef yet. So I also okay. never have been in Australia or in, in New Zealand. Well, we yeah, see what yeah, comes yeah. next. <laughs> I tell you what, I've dived. My first dive ever was the Great Barrier Reef, and that kind of blew me away. It was just so, so amazing. And it was kind of called like a tourist dive. And then I, I did my open water dive ticket in a place called the Poor Nights in New Zealand. And it's just a phenomenal experience. I really enjoyed it. I will have a look, really. I plan to go to Australia with my family in the near future. And so my son already was there over a backpack or a work and travel experience over, I think, six to eight months in New Zealand. So he saw your whole country and all your island. He was very amazed. Wow, so good. No, you should definitely come down to this part of the world and take a look around. But, you know, I've only just moved back to New Zealand after seven years of being away. And my last, you know, two years have been, or two and a half years have been in Europe. And I tell you, I, I just love the diversity. And there's so many different countries to go to and visit in Europe. So I can see why you don't necessarily have to travel far from your home. <laughs> that's that's right. Yeah, we have a lot of great spots in, in, in Europe. But as you know, in Germany, the weather is cold. Today, it's a very, very rainy. It's very cold. So in, in the winter time, you like to travel to the to the warm countries. So last time I was in Orlando at the Ignite and it was a beautiful experience with 30 degrees. So not too bad. How did you find Ignite, the content? So I, I like Ignite very much. So there was a, some something or somehow a speaker together with a guy from the Microsoft Corp all around Dynamics Project Service Automation. So I was invited there. I only stood two days at the conference. It's amazing. It's so big and there's so much of information and possibility to learn more there. It's a really great chance for you and especially as well because I was there with some of my employees. 
So it was also a great success and a great, they took out a, a huge benefits out of the conference. Excellent, excellent. So tell us about your company. What is it? How did it, you know, come about? And tell me a bit about the journey you've been on. Yeah, first of all, the history of my company starts during my studies. So I made two guys there and we become friends and we made a decision to found our own company after university. And so we decided to go to a system integrators, to different system integrators in Germany and to learn the business. And so then we started in 2000 with ProMX more or less in the area of Microsoft of Microsoft Exchange Server. So in Microsoft okay, Exchange wow. Server, not because you want to do some infrastructure things and migrate from Exchange 5.5 to Exchange 2000 and Windows 2000. No, we did it because there is a possibility or there was a possibility to add on development on top of the Exchange. And so we created on the workflow thing a lot of amazing workflows all around room reservation stuff, people reservation stuff, and so on. And that was the uh, beginning of ProMX. So we started as an, I would say, individual software development company. And so that was in 2000. Tell me a bit about what your product lineup that you have now. Of course, 2003 was a year where Microsoft gave birth to, uh, today you say Microsoft Dynamics. In earlier times, it was Microsoft CRM. And this was a, a real milestone for us because we saw that there are possibilities not only to be a system integrator of a CRM system, so being a consultant in this area. And that was pretty, pretty nice because it was a complete new product and you get the visibility from Microsoft in this moment. But on the other hand side, there's a lot of possibilities to extend Microsoft CRM also to this in this time in a pretty easy way. And so it was becomes for us a platform for the XRM idea and with the XRM idea our ISV journey started. So so were you operating at that point as a system integrator? So you were actually taking, you know, MS CRM, using it as a application development platform with XRM and then just doing, you know, software builds for customers based on their requirements? Or or did you start out with the intention of of building additional functionality directly on the platform? We did it both. So for us, uh, system integration was a necessity and is ongoing a necessity because it pays our bills and gives us the money for investments in this area. So for being an, an, being an ISV, we started to use the XRM system exactly for the area where Microsoft later comes out with a PSA. So we had our own project service and resource management of application on top. So this time there were three I would say competitors with us, three competitors in the market delivering their own PSA. So we realized that this could be the vehicle to transport and to create products. The first product we had in that area was not related to CRM. It was related to SharePoint this time, to the early version of team services. And we sold this as well to really big customers in Germany, especially to Siemens. Okay, okay, okay. So when you say team services, what, what do you mean? I don't know if you remember, there was a part of Office XP where there was, there was the first version of SharePoint inside. I, I think it was team services. Okay, yeah, there was yeah, a diff- yeah. There, there was yeah. a different name. So, And on this platform, we started our, our journey to become an ISV. Okay, so what, what were you building on team services that you were able to sell? We built a time tracking solution on top of it and a project management solution and a resource management solution. And we brought these together and sold it to companies who are services driven. Right. So is, you know, there's there's a global, definitely I was brought up with this, you know, in, in New Zealand that, you know, if something is German made, it's always like the best. It's the best engineering. It's the most articulate and the way it's thought out. Did you find that that kind of whole German engineering was coming into the way you were building your software? Because you obviously created some incredible pieces of technology that companies were really interested in buying. I don't know. So So I saw that there is a demand on having a specific software available to solve or to help them to cover their, their, their gaps they might have. And that was the approach. And we saw in the platform, we saw the possibility to put in this functionality in a very quick manner. So it is always a question. In the, and I have learned a lot since 2003 about ISVs and the platform and technology, everything around. But it was there was a really a need to, to get it quick to the road 
I do not have an investor in my background, so I'm putting all my, my, my cash flow into, into the area of software development and, and I would say product development. So it was a need to be, be become or to be very quick bringing something to the market and try it out. And to this time, I would say approach of a minimal viable product. I did it. But I didn't know it. Right, right, right. So, so when you say you did a minimum viable product, did you get it to the point that you know people would pay you money to buy it, and then you iterated and built on top of it from that point? Exactly, exactly this way. So, so tell me, as of today, what is your main product lineup and suite, and and how many iterations, if you like, have they been since two thousand and three when you started on this journey? Well, good. I tell you a little bit about the journey, and then I come to the to the status today. So, after having this stuff on the team services with 2003, we go to the XRM platform, and as well, we sold this from CRM 2011 onto the market. So, we become a first time with our solution. How is it called? A finalist of the Microsoft Partner Award in 2010, and a winner with our solution in 2011. So this was uh, the approach to the market, and in this moment we started to try to market it, to bring it to the market. So we had booths in all in, in the conversions, in the worldwide partner conferences, on events in Germany or in Europe, and so we started to market it. But to be open, it was maybe too early to do this because software wasn't yet right. The architectures, the possibilities to exchange or to to import export solutions in the way how really it could work as a platform in 2011 it it, it was it was too early it becomes later a possibility this to, during this time there was something in the Microsoft universe Microsoft released 2011 and three or four months later they told us that Silverlight is out of out of lifetime yeah. so that was the first big issue where we run into problems. Second point was to install our solution, which also had some clients for doing time tracking in Outlook and so on. We had services and things around. Even to install our solution in 2011, we needed or to train people to install it. We needed more than a week to do trainings in, in, in Canada and US. So that was not really the best moment. Going further, it comes to the point that Microsoft, we try to convince Microsoft to do marketing with us. Microsoft told us in 2013, I think, Peter, stop. We are doing our own PSA software development. And that brought us, that brought us, you know, in Germany, you say you are standing on a carpet and somebody picks the carpet away. I don't know how it's, mm -hmm. yes, yes, yes. How you say it in English. We, we would say pull, pull the carpet from under you. Pull the carpet under you. So I was really amazed about this situation. That was sarcastic. So I was really amazed. And after a while, we come in touch with the R&D department in Redmond or in Bellevue about this. We got deeper and deeper in the PSA. And now we are there that we don't have our own, I would say, full-fledged application. We are now in more or less in the add-on area, so we develop functionality out of a miss of uh, needed functionality. And of, of course, if you're familiar with the PSA, you know that there was also some, some issues in the usability. So it was very hard to, to adopt the software. So we were in that area, and that was, was the point we say, okay, we have a lot of knowledge. We are working with Microsoft together. We are... I would say something like an advisor to Microsoft to, to give us feedback. We worked on the whole since the beginning. Also, we were involved in that. Nobody had an idea about PSA. It was also very special to see this and how Microsoft is working. So, and nobody knows about that. And we invented and we brought our people in. And today, and this is status today, today we are one of the maybe a handful partners in the world who did PSA projects. And then so uh, there, in the moment, there is more or less no real competition available. And we were really, really successful. So in the last, I would say since August, we won a loan aid project in that area. And that is as well related to our own, to our own ISV. So we have add-on products, as I told you. We are an ISV embed in this area. And we are since October in the ISV Connect program. Okay, okay. So tell me, so so just so I can understand this, are you pretty much a PSA implementer that has also created a range of add-ons to PSA? So Would that my, be right? my goal and my strategy is 
to be an ISV and to sell to the market and to sell to everybody who has the ability and maybe already with customer engagement is gone, the plan for the licenses, but I see a huge possibility to sell the product. I'm in the ISV Connect program, so I have, I need, I don't, I don't think something like 6 million euros revenue on my IP to f- to be member of the ISV Connect program. In the, oh, so you're talking in the about the 20% tier? You're talking exactly. about the 20%? Yeah, you're yeah, excellent. Exactly. And now I see as well the real possibility with all Microsoft is doing in that area. I see a real possibility to be really successful with the ISV product. In the, today, up to date, I think in the last two years, we covered about, out of our revenue, I would say 30% is coming from the, the, from the IP. And I want to go there that as a switch. I want to go in the, really in the area only to deliver and only working on the ISV solution to bring more industry, industry solutions, as to go more vertical, over more vertical with the solution and to sell this, to sell this over our own partner network. So the Project Service Alliance, we found it in the end of last year. Okay. This, this is very interesting stuff. Now, what, what interests me there is that you've opted to go for the 20%. You're, you know, you're you focused on that because the ISV Connect program has a 10% tier level and then the 20% tier. A lot of ISVs out there feel that they didn't want to get involved with that. And why have you embraced it like you have? Yeah, first of all, if I give my partner resellers a 15 or 20%, it's the same as I give it to Microsoft. That is first. So for me, to scale... And to scale in the market is the same. So second, Microsoft is putting their Microsoft sellers into. They bring thousands of Microsoft sellers into to sell your post-sale prioritized solution. And we are post-sale prioritized in the moment with four different solutions. So they bring in their sellers. And this is something which paid off already. Wow. Okay. Tell, tell me about the payoff you've seen, because this is a good news story that a lot of people are not hearing yet. So first of all, you know, there is a lot of demand on the PSA, there is a momentum. And I think I'm not 100% sure why we why there are only some integrators who are doing this. But the Microsoft sellers now knows that we do have IP in the PSA area. So they have a look up in their own in their own app source. So there's a different view they see and that there's for them a possibility to earn money. So the sellers at Microsoft get paid of the 20% you are paying for the for your solution and then you have a huge sales force on the market that must lead and this already do to a lot of leads where we sell our solution to customers and then of course we are a software integrator in the moment they are not so much integrators in the PSA area available yet we are also doing projects or we really support partners for example in mexico in portugal in uk and we're also talking in the mo and in France, and we are talking to a partner. So we come back to Australia. We are talking with a partner in Australia where we want to work with. So and so we help them. We train the people. We are doing the first steps. We rent them our references we did in the market with huge companies worldwide doing the PSA stuff. So this is really paid off already. It started to pay off. So we have already revenue because of this. Excellent. Excellent. You mentioned there are four solutions that you've built. Can you kind of just break down? I'm not familiar with them. What are the four solutions? I think there are three solutions. Let's have more or less a look to. But we have three solutions which extend the functionality of PSA in the area of time tracking, approval management of multi, multi-customer, multi-project Gantt tool, as well one, one solution for the area of invoice management and invoice creation. So that are the three or four solutions in the PSA area. We do have solution for, we call it Pro Storage Saver. So there there are also some competitor products for them that is also on the market. And other one I can't remember remember in the moment. Okay, so that's very cool. Is part of your, and it sounds like it is, is part of your model selling through other SIs around the world? Yes, that's exactly. That is what we want to achieve. So ProMix is part of, of an enterprise. So what enterprise company with 500 employees, ProMix itself, 50% or a little bit less than 50% of the shares is on my side. The rest is on the side of the enterprise. 
And we are in Pro MX, I would say approximately 65 guys, technical guys in the dynamics area. So with 65 guys in a worldwide market, and it, it, it is now a worldwide market because of AppSource, we get a lot of leads all over the world every day. And it is a worldwide, you are only able to cover this in the ways that you have people who are able to implement it and as well to know language skills are necessary. So with English, you can do a lot, but if you go to Mexico, you will lost. Yeah, there you have to you have the need to use Spanish or you go to Portugal for Portuguese or for Brazil as well and uh, Brazil. So, you, you know, without partners, it's not possible. Yes, yes. Okay, so this is very interesting. So when you started to sell internationally, there's a couple of things I want to understand. How did you handle? How did you handle one, supporting your product in, in, in foreign time zones and then also transacting from a currency perspective? Did you Did you sell the licenses directly from yourself or did you sell them via partner and therefore that would have been handled? And then... How did you handle training of your partners in remote locations? Yeah, also selling is the way how it is needed. So normally we do our invoice always in, in euro worldwide. There's only a need to do this in dollar in, in US. But yes, uh, yes. in the rest of the world, we are selling our products in, in euro. And so we sell it direct or indirect. This depends how the customer is approaching us. But this is also it depends on if they also want to get the Dynamics licenses on top. So if this is an ISV bundle like in the ISV bed area, then the contract is di uh, directly with us. And we do direct uh, three persons contracting. So partner, customer, and us. And in other ways, and if, if a partner acts as a reseller, he's buying the licenses from ProMX and sell it to their end customers. Excellent, excellent. So how do you handle support then across international time zones? Uh, we do have a 24-7 support at ProMX. And of course, we train our partner. And all of these partners are Dynamics partners. So most of the problems are not related to the software. Most of the problems are related to the installation and the configuration on site. And so for, I would say, ProMix is handling only the third, third level support. And so we do have support contracts, which we sign with our partners. And if there is a necessity, we also sign it with our end customer. Or we see end customer wherever it is our or from our partner. Yeah, okay, that makes sense. Hey, that's so, that's so interesting. What have you found, like, have you found that only 20% of your partners sell 80% of your product? Or are you finding just a lot of partners may sell one or two projects a year? What's been the patterns that you've seen over the, the last few years? Partner contract and partner program, I can tell you stories. Yeah, I'm interested. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but saying in this, as a, in earlier times, starting in 2010, going market, seeing partners, we had 80 partners. So we got disrupted by Microsoft over one and a half, two years. There was no interaction on our side, only maintaining existing customers. So it was not possible to, to sell anymore our own product. And so today I would say we might have some of these partners which are on our partner role, but I would say only four or five. So very less number is really, really selling. So, and I think that is, is the biggest problem at all. You get a lot of people who sign a contract. And we did it in the beginning that we don't charge any partner fee. And so a lot of guys signed because they had, ah, maybe I have a chance to sell it once in a year. And yeah, of course, I can use the licenses for my own. So that was a, what I would say is was a major driver for, for partner acquisition is I want to use this home for myself. So we changed the program. So we have now a fee, but you get the fee paid back if you are successful selling our products. So a partner who's selling, has not to pay any fee. That is a change. And so in the moment, and you know, a lot of partners don't want to pay money. They want to be, ah, let us have a look and look for the first contract. And I can't understand this because negotiating a contract and not living a contract is a waste of money, a waste Correct. of time, a waste of money and time. So, and so we now have partners and all these partners, I would say have, if they haven't already done business, they are nearly, or they are in, in, they are nearly on. They are on the way to close their first projects. Right. And so, what's the most furthest project that you've sold away from Germany? 
geographically. Also the biggest project what we are driving in this area with our own software is also our own customer. And it is also a very, very well-known worldwide acting Microsoft partner. So we are talking about software one. Excellent. Okay, okay. And what about location? What's the furthest location out of Germany you've sold to? New Zealand? Have you sold any in New Zealand? Ah, uh, that I really don't don't know. But I think with about 70 to to 80 subsidiaries and locations in the world with Software One, I could imagine if you have a Software One office in New Zealand, yeah, then they are using our software. Excellent. Interesting. Okay, so that's really cool. So talk to me about marketing. You know, where is the right place to spend your marketing dollar? You have the choices of going to Microsoft conferences. You've got industry events that you might attend. There's, you know, some say you should spend on social media some on Google AdWords, some on, you know, your website, brochures. Where, where have you found the most effective way to spend your marketing dollar? Huh. This is, I think, a real differentiator to, to, to the other partners because we realized since we started the ISV business that this kind of business is only working with the right marketing approach. So as I told you in the beginning, we spend a lot of money for the booths on the Microsoft exhibitions. But I would say we stopped this. We are doing marketing in the moment. So you remember 65 people in the technical business. I think 30 or 40 people in our own marketing, in our own marketing department covering all channel, social media channel you can expect. So from having different Twitter and Facebook accounts because of languages to our company and to our products, having Xing and LinkedIn. Xing is something similar to LinkedIn, but it is only... I think sensible for the German market or maybe for the Dach market, doing as a LinkedIn stuff, doing Google AdWords things, doing a lot of events, which we are driving. So we are having a lot of events all around our products with Microsoft and without Microsoft. So we're having a lot of things doing around the needed landing pages. And then we do AdWords campaigning in, in, in different channels and so on. We're doing a lot of things there. Yeah. If I was to give you 10 million euros to spend on marketing, you could only spend it on marketing. Where would you spend it? And you can only choose one thing to spend it on. 10 millions and you want to spend? On marketing, but you can only market to choose one, either channel, platform, event, technique, whatever. What would you spend your 10 million euro on? I would say I would go to social media and I want to spend it in, in, in campaigning. I was not expecting this question, and I have a huge team. They will maybe tell me, well, you are a guy here telling things, so we have some different <laughs> ideas about that. But I, I, for my own, would say, I think you make a huge rumble, you must be heard in the world. So I would really go to, to social media and, and spend it in the area of LinkedIn. Okay, LinkedIn. That's very cool. That's very precise. I like that. And yeah, I can, I can understand what you're saying there. How many languages have you transfer, translated your application into so far? Also, our, our, our languages are translated in English, in French, and in Spanish. Okay, so three languages at the moment. And German, of course. Ah, okay, so that's four. Okay. And Portuguese? No, not yet. Not yet. Okay, very, very interesting, very interesting. So if you look back across your career of building this ISV business, what are the key lessons that you've you've learned? If you were to encourage other ISVs out there in the industry, what are the kind of key things that you would say, be aware of this, do this, and don't do that? Yeah, so starting and being an ISV business, I, I would say I would say having the right maybe portfolio or the right product. So having the right product idea, first of all. Having an, an understanding where you are in, where are the needs. And is there a market? So as a project portfolio, I, I, I would say. Second would be maybe the point to say, okay, having to find the right value proposition. You must really work on this. And I say one euro spend in development, three euros following in marketing. You have spent a lot of money in the marketing area, but then you really need the real story behind. And the story is, the content of a story must be a value proposition. But can a customer customer get what can he achieve out using your software for their businesses? I think that are the two points and 
of course, being an ISV, as you know, builds a software, thinking about support, thinking of all the things you need around driving the business as well. Doing marketing in the end is a question of lead generation. And so lead generation is also a point which which is a, a real need. And I saw a lot of I saw a lot of leads from the Microsoft plat coming from the Microsoft platform. So I see for people who want to go in the ISV area, maybe Microsoft could be a really great partner having these approach with App Source. So also being on the App Source and achieve I think we, we have approximately one hundred leads in a month coming from from the platform or from the app source so having think about how you can generate the leads where are the pos uh, biggest possibilities to do so and the next number of leads so that was i mentioned linkedin app source costs me only 20 percent of my my ip i sold yeah linkedin is something you can also go and and address the market and address potential customers so that is the reason that i want to invest money in, in linkedin app source is something what you can get from microsoft directly and this would be a great great fit so yeah i would say that are the is is, is the three points that i would mention in the for starting an isv business yeah man that is so good that is so good tell me about selling software as an isv do you have trained salespeople? Uh, we are a company who has very less fluctuation of people inside. So it means we are a team in the sales and the marketing. Sales and marketing we're, we're working very close together and as well producing a lot of the necessary, necessary collaterals, uh, marketing papers and books and white papers and whatever. And so the people inside ProMix are trained anyway. And if we start with somebody new, we start from scratch, I would say. So we bring in young people and we have no people who are already knows how to sell solutions and are so silverbacks guys who exactly know how to do and don't are not able maybe to adopt new ideas. So we bring in at least every time new people here. We train it in inside our team and this is I think our success. Okay. That's that's very good. And yeah, I have a lot of synergies with the way you're thinking there. Tell me what happens. Let, let's say you get a lead from AppSource and let's say this is a fictitious lead and it's going to end up closing. What is the steps that you take from taking that lead where you might just have the person's name and email address? How do you get it from there to a closed sale and implemented in their business? Yeah, we try to support them. If there's really a chance to get in contact, and you know a lot of these people try want to be anonymous to the point that they made maybe a decision or they have a collection of possible <laughs> vendors or suppliers, so they get anonymous. So if you have a chance to contact them, we try to follow them up in a personal way. In the past, we had done a lot of things all around marketing campaign and workflows and sending out emails every day and every day and every day. I think this is something which everybody is doing and that would really annoy the people. And of course, if somebody is clicking and in the beginning of AppSource, you simply clicked on a button and you received an email, but you were never ever even able to install the solution because you are a business guy and not a technical guy who is able to install a solution to the system. So this has gone to the bin. Today, it is a, there is a bigger possibility to work on app source with these test drive functionality. So as well, business decision makers are able to have a look in to your software, maybe get a learning pass there. So if you go to a program, fast start, or for example, go to Veripark on the Veripark website and have a look to the next best action web app, and you will see a possibility how you can really create trial the software and we do the same so we have also a learning pass there uh, give the, the customer a chance and to lead them to through the system so the, to give them from the first moment the best experience what is possible and we are working on this experience i would say not maybe daily but very very close so try to to make it better and better and that is the way we try to convince the customer and on the other hand side as i thought or as i told you we try to, to reach them we try to talk to them but i would say maybe 20 percent of the as i say 20 of the 80 of the 100 leads per month 20 percent of them are people where we can address where we come to a communication where and there we do have a chance really to do 
and to follow up and to go deeper in the in the software. And this is then in the moment mainly this leads with the most success. Mm -hmm. So so of those twenty percent, what's the time frame from engagement you getting a lead to them going, let's progress? Do you have is it like three months, six months, nine months, twelve months? How it, quickly it, do you move through that sales cycle? It was six to eighteen months, and not only because of AppSource, I would say it was every lead. So we have really a chance in the moment. I think the quickest deals we did are four weeks. Wow. Okay. So you're saying things have improved with AppSource? Yeah. AppSource got better and better. And I think that was also a need. So they understood. They invested a lot of money. And now they come out with these commercial AppSource platform and, and ideas all around. So they really want to, to build on top of AppSource their selling portals, their portal for their there are ISVs and as well, are you in the Microsoft, you know about OCP catalog and these things. Everything of that is moved to, to apps, uh, app source one and there's no need to have double work to input data for your solution. So you have a central application, a central commercial application to do. And that is the right way I think Microsoft is doing. Excellent. So let's talk about co-sell for a moment. And in AppSource, right, you have the ability to put the co-sell content so that Microsoft sellers can learn about your product and therefore sell it. Are you seeing successes with your co-sell content and the various Microsoft sellers? So I don't see this. I think it is success because I told you that we are getting a lot of leads coming from Microsoft with direct contact. But I am not 100% sure if this is related to our to our co-sell to our co-sell content. But I, I think it is because you know there are such a lot of numbers of applications and products available and partners in in the market. So with the OCP content in AppSource, I think this helps the partners or the Microsoft sellers, sorry, not the partners, the Microsoft sellers worldwide. To understand that there are solutions which are already successful, which they can use. And of course, the sales cycle, as you question me, is a need what Microsoft wants to achieve. And of course, ISV products are this which help Microsoft to sell quicker, more licenses to the market because they get rid of most of the needed services, consulting services around the project, which is based on an ISV solution is much more quicker and easier to sell don't need so much i would say high trained senior personal and so it is it is a way really for microsoft to sell in a quick manner and it is a really big chance for us as a partner to get these how should i say repeatable recurring business in a way it comes and the money is flowing and that is exactly what you want to achieve right <laughs> exactly exactly Tell me, one of the challenges that a lot of ISVs have with the way solutions work with Dynamics and the Power Platform is the ability to protect your intellectual property. Do you do anything special around, you know, preventing the unauthorized use of your IP? Yeah, we're trying. We are trying to make it hard for somebody who wants to steal our intellectual property. So we try to put some, some, so we have our own license check server in the internet on Azure and every of our application make a look up if there is, is a right to use. But you know, this is maybe related to some apps insights that is not related to the data schema and the data. If you have once installed it, then you can use it and, or you can copy it, whatever is it, something you can't prevent. But of course, the knowledge inside and the needed knowledge and experience to implement and to answer a question on the customer side, I think that is the biggest difference. And it's also a kind of protection, I would say. And say that this way, we had very bad experiences all around this with an, with a partner. I think it was from Australia. And so he, yeah, you never can prevent, uh, prevent yes, it. Yeah. But correct, uh, correct. you can do, you can do as much as possible. And so you need your strategy. And, I think that the best strategy at all is to make the partners successful with you together that there is absolutely no need for them to copy anything. Yeah, yeah, I like that. Make the partner successful with you. Tell me about your relationship with Microsoft. Like, And once again, I, I probably want to, not so much your relationship, but what would your advice to be to ISVs about working with Microsoft? What should they do to foster a great relationship with Microsoft? 
Okay, you mean existing ISV, so an ISV who has already his own old product or who want a new one? Brand new startup ISV. What type of relationship should they build with Microsoft? Who, what, where, what geographies, that type of thing? So I am very deep involved with Microsoft being in the inner circle, being in the partner advisory council in this area, especially for ISVs and so on. So I have a real good idea how they think and how they drive their business and one thing what I think that I understood it in the right way is we are looking for, we are, we are onboarding ISVs in the moment. We are looking for ISVs exactly because of the reasons I told you. We are onboarding ISVs. We are looking for ISVs. I would say try to get in contact with Microsoft. Maybe do this on, on events like Ignite or Inspire or any other event in your, in your region which is in that area of ISVs with Microsoft, get in contact with them, talk to other Microsoft partners who are already successful in the area, get some insights. So I'm also doing this if, if people asking me about my experience, similar to what you did today with me, then I try really to give them and an, to give them some, some insights. And if I have a chance, I also link them to, to people at Microsoft. But that is limited to Germany and maybe limited to France because there I have this kind of business is normally if you are not an I, as you said, you are a new ISV, so you are not a global ISV, then you have to go to your regional office and, and talk to the people. Yeah, very good. Very good. Do you do any engagement with the product team in Redmond? Especially in the PSA and in the field services area. Yes, we do. Okay, excellent. And so once again, if an ISV, for example, was specializing in Microsoft Dynamics 365 marketing, they should try and engage with the product teams that own that product, I take it, if they're going to build add-ons, et cetera, to that solution. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Excellent. Any kind of pitfalls, like things that you would say to, you know, once again, telling you ISVs, don't do this or, you know, avoid doing this or learn from my mistakes type thing? Let me give two advices. And the first, I think it's maybe a little bit funny, but, but do you remember XRM video from Microsoft yep, from yep, 2015 yep. about insurance management, cloud yeah, management and so on? Cloud management and Power management. Yeah, yeah, totally. Exactly. I, just, I, just, I just played it in Orlando in one of my sessions to yeah. see. How, I think there are 40 something ideas or solutions in that video. Simply put the link to this video to our podcast from today. And I think this will give a lot of ideas where you can by using the Microsoft platform as a base where you can extend the platform to your own XRM product. This is something we did, for example, with healthcare and, and we have a therapist platform based on Dynamics 365 as an XRM point. That is a possibility to, be, to become an ISV. So, and to do something like what you not should do is don't develop full-fledged application, go with a minimal viable product, Try to to uh, to approve, uh, not try to get proof, not to approve. Try to get proof that the product itself finds potential customers. If there is a real market behind, I would say that is what I suggest to, to the people. Not go the full thing, start small, see if there's success. If there's no success, put it away as quick as possible and restart with something else. I like it. I like it. Such great, great advice. Okay. Time to do some quick fire questions. Before we get on to some quick fire questions, and these are really not about software or Microsoft or anything, these are just about questions in your life and they're very random and it'll be interesting to see how they translate. But is there anything you want to add and share with our guests before we switch to these quick fire questions? No, I think let us go to the questions. Okay, okay. Here's your first one. Would you rather be too hot or too cold? I'm too hot. <laughs> if you could switch places with one of your friends for one day, who would it be? I would change places maybe with my friend from Belgium. It's Wim Gökens. I would ch change my place with him because he's traveling much more in the world as me. Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay. So what was the first thing you remember buying with your own money? My first motorcycle. Nice. Nice. The way I really invest is the first time real money. Yeah. This was my motorcycle. Excellent. Excellent. As I was a little boy, I, I invested in aquariums. Mm -hmm. So I had okay. a lot of fishes yeah. and five or six aquariums as I was 12. And I, I sold fishes to potential to customers. So that was my first 
approach to the market, but <laughs> the real investment was my motorcycle. Wow, I like it. I like it. What's your favorite quote? That's a quote from Mr. Einstein. So, and that is a problem now how to translate it. In, in Germany, you will say, nur wer weiß, wie Wolken schmecken, der weiß, wie Schmetterlinge fliegen. So, it, it's very hard to translate. I would say it's a cloud, it's a cloud quote. Sally uh, saying, uh, you have to know exactly where you're in and how you're in to, to really be successful in this area. Awesome, awesome. I can give you the quote later on after yeah, our talk. So cut it out, yeah, cut it out. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> and you, yes, can yes. Get a, you can get the quote exactly if you like. No, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave it in in German because then all our German listeners will feel like you've spoken directly to them. So I, I like that, I like that. What chance encounter changed your life forever? What my life changed forever was a moment where I married my wife. <laughs> excellent. What excellent. should I what should I answer? That that's that's <laughs> the best answer if she's going to be listening to this. <laughs> we will see. <laughs> I like it. What's the worst job you've ever had? The worst job what I ever had was working as a student in a kitchen of a furniture company. Mhm. So come? I have to wash a lot of dish ah, and that yes, I yes, yes, uh, yes. wash uh, very hard time. <laughs> <laughs> Is there anyone that you would recommend as a guest for a future podcast, particularly somebody else maybe working in the ISV space with Microsoft? Yeah, that is a guy I mentioned already. It's Wim Gerkens from, from Very Park. He founded Very Park in, in Western Europe and is pretty much successful. Before he had his own uh, company called, maybe you know, Traviata, that was an insurance solution. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, also in the early beginning of, of, of Dynamics. So he is and he was very successful. And I could imagine that he has a lot of insights for you. Excellent. I'll ask that you do an introduction to him on LinkedIn, maybe. And it'll be great to get him on the show and, and hear his story. Peter, it's been so good to have you on the show. I have learned so much from you. I really enjoyed it. Before we go, if people want to connect with you, where's the best place that they can find your website or connect with you online? Also, first of all, you find Peter Linke in, in, in LinkedIn. Also, as he's pronounced it in German, you would say Peter Linke. In English, it's Peter Linke, or in American, they say E. I dislike it, but they say E. And you can go to promx.net website. Hey, thanks again for joining me on today's show. It's been a great journey. I hope you've uh, found this whole set, you know, interview with, with, with Peter as enthralling as I did. I learned so much from him. Remember, full show notes for this episode can be found at nz365guide.com forward slash 164. I'm your host, business applications MVP, Mark Smith, otherwise known as the NZ365 Guy. If you have any questions or want to start a conversation with me on anything we've discussed on here, uh, LinkedIn Messenger is the best way to hit me up. Just connect with me and let's open a dialogue. Anyhow, bye for now.